Is this recording? Yes. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about total and partial orderings. And I would also like to continue this uh, rational class example that we were using yesterday. So I was trying to figure out, there's someone in here who asked me about adding integers. I don't think he's here. Okay, so I'm going to pull up this example again. Where did I put it? Hopefully, was it this one? Uh, okay, so I just simplified stuff in here a little bit from yesterday. So something that I was doing that was dumb was that um, I was pulling out the greatest common divisor and I never had to, right? The, the constructor, this initializer, whenever the, uh, this initializer is going to pull out the greatest common divisor, right? So whenever I, I return a rational number, the... Um, simplification is going to happen automatically. Right? I listened to the lecture. I said something yesterday uh, along the lines of, do you see how I cleared the GCD in all of these places? This really means that I should have had this as a method somehow. And it turns out it, it, it already was a method. So uh, there's only one place where we have to clear the GCD, and that's when we actually instantiate the object. So we had the string. We had the representation. We could add stuff. OK, so I, I discovered something about add the uh, yesterday. So I was trying to make it to be the case, so let me just read this in. I was trying to make it be the case that you could do mixed type addition. Okay, so it is the case in Python that everything is an object. Everything. A float, an integer, a list, a string. The console itself is an object, right? That's what this init equal main thing is. It's us reassigning a magic method. So. But it is the case in Python that you can take something that's an integer, and you can take something that is a float, and you can add these two things together. And Python knows to cast this upward, right? Because all integers are also technically floats. So I should be able to add an integer to a float, but then just return the type that's like above it, right? So now we're sort of getting into class inheritance, which I don't want to get too into, because that can get confusing. Uh, but in any case, I wanted to do something, so I think I have a P and a Q, and remember that we could add these together and subtract these and divide the, whoops, and, div and divide them and multiply them. Now what I want to be able to do is something like take P and add to it 1, right? This should give us 3, oh, oh right, because I already implemented it. Um, so I managed to, to, dis to change the object a bit so that I can do mixed type arithmetic with, with a caveat. <laughs> I can only do it when the second thing is the thing that needs to be casted. And I'll show you why. So it turns out when you do this arithmetic, um, the thing, it, so Python will scan this left to right and it will say, ah, I see a 1, it's an integer. I see a plus, I should now call the uh, magic method addition for integer objects. And then it sees that P is of type rational, and then it complains because it doesn't know how to add those things. Now when I do this, it scans again from left to right. It says P is a rational object. Here's an addition. I should call the, uh, the rational addition now. So here's how I handled that. So this is the addition, which is taking a self and an other. And I'm saying if the type of other is integer, we, didn't, we haven't really done much type checking, but suffice it to say that's how you do a type check. Um, I just return the self plus the rationalization of the other thing, right? Just any number over one, right? <clears throat> but the problem is, is the order matters, which is not very nice in terms of addition, right? Because you should, we expect that one plus p is the same as p plus one, and it's not the case. So what could be done is we could search online and figure out how to overload the integer addition um, operator to tell it what to do when it encounters an integer and a rational. And we could do something like that, but uh, I think this is like just getting too far into the weeds. Uh, but suffice it to say, you, you could really overload everything. Okay, so what did we not do yesterday? So yesterday, we didn't implement any of these into our rational class. And today I'd like to spend some time doing so. So what does it mean for two objects to be equal to one another? Or what should it mean? Right, so we have something like P 
P is, let me see, rational a half. Q is rational a half. So do we expect this is true or false? Um, I think they're doing it by ID. No. So right now what Python is doing is, so in the absence of a, uh, a user-defined magic method, it's going to just have some default things. And the default for checking class equivalence is, uh, uh, you're checking the pointers themselves, right? So we, don't, we also don't have this, right? Oh. I didn't know that. Maybe it's already there's two there's two separate um, functions to check the IDs and values. Because the values are all the same it won't return true. But yeah, yeah, I, I expected it to be the opposite. So you say X right? is y, so Yeah, yeah. So is P is is P Q? No. Uh anyways. Shh. Should we make these two things equal? Like, we have to think about this for a little bit. Like, I know their values are equivalent, but, like, they're not equivalent objects. So it depends, like, really what it is you want to do with the object itself. Um, why don't we just stay in the realm of, like, mathematics, where we should say that a half is equal to a half. It should also be the case that uh, rational of a half is equal to rational of two quarters, right? Yeah, well, let's go now and, and add it to the, to the class. So what do we need? We need an equal. Okay. I don't think we're going to need a GCD. Uh, definition equal, self, of, oh, yeah, self and other. So what should be the condition now for checking equality? Mm, you're moving us into floats. I don't want to use floats. I don't want to have to divide. I don't want to integer divide either. Right. Use the integer equality. Right? The whole point of moving to rationals was to not use float arithmetic. So we definitely shouldn't use float arithmetic when, when uh, writing an equal. Right? Because we're, we're going to introduce all of the float errors and then things that should maybe be equal no, will, will no longer be equal. This will maintain the symbolic exactness right, that we are trying to build into the system. Does everyone understand that statement? Yes. Won't they already be simplified? Yeah, so I'm not saying we're going to have to reduce anything. But then how do you check that a half is equal to a half? Right, you're, you're, maybe you're thinking just stick an equal inside. I'm saying that equal has yet to be defined by us, right? So I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make, make a statement about the GT, GCD. Oh, that, that's not a bad idea either. Because, okay, so be, only because they are simplified already, we could say something like, that's, that's true. We, we could say something like self.numer has to be equal to other.numer and self.denominator has to be equal to other.numer. Okay. Other.denominator. Yeah. Maybe this is the more computer science-y way of thinking about it. It's better because you do less arithmetic than I do. Um, right. Okay. But then, then we really have to insist that we're reducing all of our fractions. Um, this would work uh, for non-reduced fractions. So it's a little bit more robust, but I pay for it by doing a little bit more work. Uh, I like yours better because it's for the, our use case, we have decided to simplify everything. So your way is better. 
So I'm going to do it this way. So let's let's check out what happens now. Uh, I have, well, let's just see. Is a rational point that's one half equal to that of, that's a rational point of two quarters? Okay, great. And even though those two things aren't going to have the same ID. And so, remember though, when we, when we, <laughs> When we introduce these things, like some other programmers now may get pissed at us, saying, look, in every other object, like our equalities are re referencing ID location. Why did you change that operating assumption? Right, so we better have strong arguments back, right? Saying, well, the reason we introduced these objects was to do arithmetic on rationals, right? So in our use case, it does make sense to make these two things equal, right? So you can always make different design decisions. You just have to sort of have some type of justification as to why that's the case. It's always a trade-off. Okay, so now we have the rest of these comparisons. Less than, greater than, um, greater than and equal, and less than and equal. So really we only need to define one of these, right? The less than operator. Less than will give us less than or equal. Uh, less than gives us not less than, which is greater than or equal. And uh, not greater than or equal gives us... Uh, I should just write these on the board. If I get uh, not and less than, right? Uh, not x less than y is x greater than or equal to y. Not x less than or equal to y is x strictly greater than y. And then uh, I also need an equal, I guess. And then I need. Uh, x is less than or equal to y is equivalent to, sorry, oh, it's equivalent to x less than y or x equals y. Okay. And of course, we don't define enough. That's just a logical operator. I'm losing my mind. So you see if we get this one and this one, we get all of them. Anyone have a question? Yes? Stretching. Okay, stretching. We should all stretch. Um, okay, because the, the question I want to ask today is this one. And this is why I like this rational example. Now, I regret not doing it with the other class, but I'll deal with that when I get there. Um, oh, no. We've done that already. So suppose you have a set of objects and want to sort them. Right? Sorting is something that we may want to do all the time. What properties precisely does the comparison operator... And I'm going to show you this new symbol, right? This curly less than. Um, it's called precedes, right? So if you sort something, like if you sort something one, two, three, one precedes two, two precedes three, right? This is a, like a symbol that we use when talking about comparing things in the general sense, right? You're very used to the edged brackets, which are comparing numbers, right? So what does our operator need to satisfy in order for the sort to be unique? I'm going to have to be a little bit mathematical today. So any ideas? Yeah. If two constants are equal, you don't have identical representation. You can figure out an order on your own. Well, that's what we're doing, right? We're going to come up with an ordering on our own. But I'm saying more generally, if I give you an arbitrary group of objects, and I say, if you give me a subset of those objects, like what property of those objects do we need in order for that subset to be orderable and unique, right? Yeah. If we're, if we're sorting, then we know that the preceding object has to be less than or equal to the following. No, but you've already used less than. I'm saying, how do we have to define less than originally, right, so that we get nice properties? I don't think you guys have the words to be able to answer this question. Then you do have the words to answer this question. So we have a notion in mathematics, and maybe now you guys are beginning to appreciate some of these things that you may think are useless in mathematics, right? If you want to define a class object with sort, you're going to have to ask yourself, geez, that sort's going to have to, like my lesson operator is going to have to satisfy a few properties in order, in order for me to be able to sort. 
And those properties are these three plus one more. So a relation, like an arbitrary maybe less than relation, on a collection of objects, A, will define a partial order when any object satisfies the case that it's less than or equal to itself. Right? A precedes A. If you take two objects from the collection of objects, it has to satisfy anti-symmetry. That is to say, if A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to A, then A has to equal B. It has to satisfy transitivity, which means that if A is less than B, and B is less than C, then A also has to be less than C. Right? Otherwise, we'd get really weirdly sorted sets if this wasn't the case. Like you guys are just like used to comparing things on the number line, which is like the easiest place to compare stuff because it, it, like it's def the definition itself is like how you sort it. But like if I gave you a bunch of shapes, for example, or rotations, right? How would you designate which one is higher than another one? Okay, so is this true for for the the integer comparison? For any integer x, is it the case that x is less than or equal to x? That, right there. What do you mean, what is anti symmetry? I don't know how to answer. There, it's that. That's the definition of anti symmetry. That's the definition of anti symmetry. I don't. If a is less than b and b is less than a, then a has to be equal to b. Right. No. This is the property of anti symmetry. Right? Right? The anti symmetry is a property imbued on a, on a comparison operator. So I'm saying this compa a comparison operator is anti symmetric provided that it satisfies that condition for all members of the set. Okay, and transitivity. Okay, that's not enough. Can anyone? Yes? Could you? For it to be symmetric. Okay, let's look it up. Uh, symmetric relation. A relates to B if and only if B relates to A. So like equals is a symmetric relation, right? I don't think you can have a compar comparison uh, operator which is symmetric, right? Because then that would say if A is greater than B, then B has to be greater than A, which is a contradiction. Right, so that's why we're saying we don't want symmetry. Symmetry destroys our relation. Right, symmetry makes the only symmetric relation is equality. Right, so that's why we want it to be not symmetric. We want it to be anti-symmetric. Right, you guys un will understand why when you learn a little bit about equivalence classes. Okay, so what's missing? There's something missing. And uh, you guys know this, right? I've bracketed the non-testable material, right? So this math is not going to show up on your exam, so just don't, don't stress about it. Right? What's missing? Okay, I want you guys to think about mathematicians. Right? So a, a big problem when you're a beginner mathematician is that you're holding in your head way too many assumptions, right, that you've just carried with you because that's how you've learned math, right? So if I say that those are the only, only things that we know about relations, there's something missing. It's quite obvious, too. Yeah? The objects are all the same, but... That's the right direction. What has to be comparable? We're defining the comparison. For any two objects, I have to tell you which one's greater than the other. Right? The comparison has to be defined for all pairings in the object. That's the one that you missed. Right? And it has to be stated. Right? That's why this is called the partial ordering. Right? I could partially order this set. You can give me all the reals, and I can give you an ordering on the integers on inside those reals. That would be a partial ordering. If you insist, in addition to having a partial ordering, that really, if I give you any two elements from the set, you have to tell me which one is bigger than the other. That becomes a total ordering. Right, so to have a total ordering, oh, I screwed this, that should be the uh, special symbol. Right, so to be a total ordering, 
all pairings from your set have to be comparable. Right? You can't say, I don't know, if I give you two things. All right, so we have uh, reflexivity, uh, anti-symmetry, transitivity, and totality. Right? Those are the four conditions that you need on a less than operator in order for it to define unique search, uh, unique sorting in, in the end. Right? Otherwise, your sort, your less than operator is um, not powerful enough. Right? These are the minimum conditions that it has to satisfy. If you guys want to learn more about this, you can take courses in algebra and rings. It's, it's really interesting. Okay, so I want to now introduce a less than operator into our rationals. But again, we're going to have to define it. So I'm going to go back to this definition, right? Because I can, I can do this. Provided okay. So I'm just going to assume for all of the subsequent proofs that we're working in the positive case. Because all that's required to work in the other cases is just to monitor what happens to these less than equal signs as you multiply and divide by negatives. It ends up being four edge cases. It's not really interesting. A lazy mathematician at this point would say, without loss of generality, assume all of these things are positive and deal with the other cases as we go. So if I say that when we compare two rationals, that we're just going to actually do the comparison of integers, this is going to be how we define, this is the definition of the less than equal operator on the rational. Right? We're borrowing the total ordering of the integers to define this in the rational. So, does everyone understand how we're comparing rationals? Right, so two-thirds, is that less than or, or not less than three-fifths? So we have something like two-thirds uh, is less than or equal to three-fifths if and only if ten is less than or equal to nine if and only if false. Okay, so that's how we're going to... Oh, that's shattered. Okay, so... I'm going to postulate that this is our ordering. Now I have to demonstrate that it's a partial ordering, which is also a total ordering, in order for me to make a statement about this ordering being able to sort lists of rationals. So what do we need again? Reflexivity, anti-symmetry, transitivity, and totality. What is this one? Oh, so here's the definition. I'm going to say uh, the fraction A over B is less than or equal to C over D if and only if AD is less than or equal to CB in the integer comparisons. So, anti-symmetry. So that means I have to take, uh, for an arbitrary fraction, that fraction has to be less than or equal to itself. So, I take an arbitrary fraction. Uh, it is the case that A is less than or equal to A on the integers, right? Because that comparison has reflexivity. Well, if A is less than or equal to A, that means A times B is less than or equal to A times B. And thereby, by definition, A over B is less than A over B. Right, so we have reflexivity. Uh, sorry, we have, this is an anti-symmetry. This is reflexivity. I put the wrong one there. Yeah. Oh, th that's the symbol for the rationals. Yeah. I think I may have switched these. Yeah, uh, the first one is reflexive, the second one is anti-symmetry. So for any two integers, we have that AB is less than or equal to AB, right? Which means I think this is the same proof twice. Yes. So which one is wrong? The first one. Anti-symmetry is wrong. Maybe we'll come back to it if we have time. Uh, Transitivity is the hard one anyways. Maybe you guys can go and fix the anti-symmetry proof. Okay, so what I need to do is prove that if A is less than B and C is less than... Uh, if A B over B is less than C over D and C over D is less than or equal to E over F, then I have to demonstrate that A over B is less than or equal to E over F. Okay, so provided that's... Okay, so that's my premise. What follows from this premise? Well, by definition, that definition, we must have the case that uh, AD is less than or equal to BC and CF is less than or equal to DE on the integers. If this is true, then this is true. I can multiply 
both sides of the first inequality by f. So you get ADF is less than or equal to BCF, and CF is less than or equal to DE. Now, if CF is less than or equal to DE, and there's a CF here, this means I can replace this CF with a DE. I just made it bigger. Right? So if it was originally bigger than ADF, then this is certainly bigger than ADF. I just replaced it with something bigger. And that actually comes from the transitivity of the comparison operator in the integers. Now I divide D, both sides, and I get AF is less than or equal to BE, which by definition means that A over B is less than or equal to E over F. Right? So thereby we have the transitive property on this definition. The last thing that we need to demonstrate is that this is total ordering. So if you give me any two arbitrary fractions, a over b and c over d, I know since the integer or arrangement is a total ordering, I know that either ad is less than or equal to bc or bc is less than or equal to ad. And by definition, I can conclude that a over b is less than or c over d, or c over d is less than a over b, and this proves totality. Right? So this is how it feels like to be in a math class, guys. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Okay, so why don't we then go implement this less than op operation into the class, and then we're going to try to sort some lists and see what happens. All right. Yeah. Um, why is totality not uh, just a, like, why, why is it just not, not just a corollary of the other definitions of what's already given the assignment? Like, like if, if we're sorting elements, then isn't the pre-assumption that no. they're all... Don't, no, don't make presumptions. Not in math. You state, your, you state your presumptions explicitly, and you make no other assumptions. You should make no other assumptions than the ones that are listed up here. But, like, if, like, if, we, are, if we are comparing two numbers, then... No, they're saying, if this comparison is true, then subsequently the thing on the right-hand side of the inference is true. Are you in the proofs class? Is he in the proofs class? Are you in the proofs class? I don't have time to teach you inference. Right? This is an argument I have to have with every first year student about inference. Right? I'm, at no point in here am I, I, am, are you allowed to pick arbitrary elements. The elements have to first satisfy the premise right? before you can make the conclusion. But then you have to find a total ordering. Right? I'm saying one of my restrictions for uh, ordering a set is that you have to tell me how all the, or, all the elements are compared. Again, I can define an ordering on the real line that only orders integers, right? So that wouldn't be total, but that would be a partial ordering of the, of the floats, right? But again, like, this is not actually ensuring that you can pick arbitrary, arbitrary elements. This is already saying that these are elements that have been added to the relation in the first place, into the comparison in the first place. Right? So I, at no point did I say that you have a guarantee that any two elements are comparable. That's why I have to make it explicit. You have, you have total order. This is a total order. A total order is a partial ordering that is also a total ordering. Okay. Um, yeah. So you have to have a partial ordering, and then you have to have that partial ordering work on everything. Then it becomes a total order. Right. Right. Uh, in any case, where was I? Oh, yes, I was implementing less than or equal. Okay, so definition, I think it's like this, less than or equal, uh, two rationals. So how are we going to do this? Return self.numerator times other dot denominator. Uh, and then I'm just going to use the regular integer comparison, uh, self dot denominator and other dot numer. Did I do this right? This is a o times c. No, a times d and b times c. Great. OK, so let's just give this test. Uh, right, do I have a p? I have a q. Is p less than q? Is q less than p? False. Uh, is p equal to q? False. Is p less than or... Does this automatically work? Okay. So how do I get less than or equal? Le, okay. So definition of less than equal 
should be easy now. That should be a return. Uh, it's either the case that self is less than other or self is equal to other. Yeah? OK. Yeah. Oh, I did this. Less than. Yeah, it should be less than. Thank you. OK, so we have P, we have Q. Is P less than Q? Is a half bigger or less than a 7? OK, a half is bigger, so this should be false. This should be true. And I should also have access to this. Right? OK. So I have less than, less than, or equal, equal. I now need a definition of greater than, which is just not, uh, sorry, return not uh, self less than equal to other. Right? And def, yeah. All right, I don't write that. I write this. And definition of greater than equal. should be return not self greater than, no, no, less than other. Yeah, I wrote all over here. Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, is that all of them? Equal, less than, less than, equal, greater than, greater than, equal. OK. Oh, do I have to? OK, sure. Define, is it like this? Yes. But like that's nice, right? Like this is this is nice. I think this is nice code, right? It's just very mathematical. I don't have to write very much. It's very clear what's happening here, and I, and I only have to maintain exactly one thing, right? Well, I guess the e e equal one as well. Okay. So let's go in here. I got my p. I got my q. Is p less than q? No. Is p greater than q? Yes. Right. One of the well, it has to be the case that p less than q, or p greater than or equal to q, has to be true in all cases. Uh, Let's see what happens if I take a rational one half and I ask if this is bigger than the rational two quarters. That should be false, right? Whoops. False. If I put an equal here, that should be true. Uh, why isn't that true? Okay, greater than or equal is wrong. How did I do this wrong? Self self is greater than or equal to other if it is not the case that self is less than other. Maybe I have to put a bracket here. Maybe I'm doing not self less than other. No. What is going on? Anyone see a mistake? Yeah, but like, yeah, exactly, right. That would fix it, but there's a bug in here somewhere. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Aha. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so now let's generate some random... OK, from random import, random randint. OK, so I want to generate a list of random rationals. OK, so I'll let the rational, uh, randint, I don't know, uh, minus 5 to 5, and randint 1 to 10, because I never actually prevented numerate denominators from being zero, and we probably should have. Uh, for anonymous in range 10. Great, so we have a s collection of random uh, rational numbers. That's a problem. Right? Well, we, we never handled zeros. So 
And well, that's going to send us down a rabbit hole as well. Because now we have to talk about the importance of zero. Like, this is the thing about any problem. If you look at it close enough, it eventually just becomes math. Like, any problem looked at close enough becomes math. So learn math, and then you can solve all problems. Uh, okay, so we should be able to sort this. Ooh, did that work? Okay, you know what we should have done? We should have, a, we should have an object method that converts itself, that I can tell it to convert itself to a float. Because then we could really uh, look at these things. Well, let's, so like this is what? Minus 3 halves, 1.5 1, 1 minus a half, 0.5, 3 eighths, yeah, quarter, 2 five, 1 eighths, 0 over 1. Okay, it worked. So, you can make this pretty robust. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Like, you may not always be able to get a comparison operator on your objects. Like, it may just make no sense, right? Like, it may, it was, it's not going to make any sense to order matrices, for example. To or, there is no ordering on the lists of lists, unless you make a really arbitrary one. I don't even know, like, it, it seems to be in, that it would be impossible to get a total ordering on matrices. I'll have to look. But this is a good question to ask. Like, what collections have total orderings on them? Well, you, you could answer that question generally. But in any case, so we've added this. What else did I want to do today? So I have filler just in case we run out of stuff to do. Uh, oh, yeah, what do you want to do Friday, Monday, Wednesday? No, no, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday for you guys, yeah? Like, I'm not going to design, like, review lectures, right? But I'll be happy to, like, do review with you guys. Yeah. Uh, I'd rather do review. Because uh, I'm, I'm going to give that talk again at some point, I'm sure. I'm trying to, I'm, that's what I'm trying to refine. I've already given it twice since I've been here, right? So I'm sure I'll give it again. Uh, plus, maybe they'll actually let me teach the data science or artificial intelligence courses. I'm trying to get them to put me into the maths, like the math heavy computer science courses, because that's my jam. Uh, well, I can try to pull off some of the finals. Like that seemed to work. OK, so why don't, for Friday, let's do some finals from previous years, right? But then for my, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, I want you guys to like come prepared with questions to ask me, and then I'll help. Because right? I don't think me re-lecturing is going to do much. Because for one, all the lectures are recorded. If you want to see me re-lecture, go watch me re-lecture. Okay, so Friday we'll do review tests. Tuesday and Wednesday, you guys bring questions, uh, even little pieces of code that you, bring anything, and we'll work together and try to figure out where the holes are in your reasoning. Okay, so what do I got? Okay, I got a couple of minutes. Um, this is still not testable. I just wanted to sort of mention this to you, because maybe you guys can think about this. So uh, you guys ha will have to take linear algebra next term, yeah? Some of you guys have to take linear algebra, yeah? So what I'd recommend when you take linear algebra is to implement, because like, linear algebra, they're going to teach you algorithms, basically. Right, how to row reduce a matrix. They're, they're, they're going to make you work like a computer. So what I recommend you guys do is write a Python library to cheat on your homework. Right? If you can implement matrix multiplication and difference, that's a good exercise for understanding the actual algorithms that they're giving you. So given that you're going to want to define a class for matrices, you're going to have to ask yourself a few questions. We have to define, you want to define at least the, all the arithmetic operations, right? Addition, okay, so I said you need addition and negation, multiplication and inversion to get all of the operations, which means you're going to have to ask yourself two questions. What is the additive negation of a matrix? Right, that one's easy. So if I told you, so the additive inverse is the thing that returns zero. So they give you two, the additive inverse was minus two, because 2 plus minus 2 gives you 0. Now, a matrix should have an additive inverse. So when you add two matrices together, you're just summing 
the individual components, right? So the additive inverse should just be the matrix with the same matrix, but every position now is flip sign. And if you added those two things together, you get the zero matrix, right? So the zero matrix is the zero of matrix arithmetic. Okay, that's the easy one. I told you that uh, inversion is a property of a multiplication operator, right? So uh, the rational number two-thirds has inverse three-halves because two-thirds times three-halves is one, and one is the multiplicative identity. Okay, you need to figure out two things for this second one. One, what matrix, well, three things actually. How do you multiply two matrices together? Well, the answer to that question is matrix multiplication. I tried to show it to you guys, but you guys sort of had a panic attack because list of lists were already too complicated. But you're going to have to learn how to do matrix multiplication. I'm surprised you don't know it already, to be honest with you. I had to learn it in high school. So once you're told what matrix multiplication is, then you have to ask yourself, what matrix exists so that I can multiply any other matrix by it and it doesn't change the other matrix? So you need the multiplica multiplicative one, right? So like two times one is two, three times one is three, oh my god, right? So one has a special property that it has no effect when multiplying. So I'm saying there is a matrix which has no effect when matrix multiplying another matrix. It is called the identity matrix. Look it up. And then once you have the identity matrix, you have to ask yourself another question. Given a matrix A, can I find a matrix B such that the product of these two matrices gives me the identity matrix? Nope, not the transpose. No, matrix inversion is something crazy difficult. I wish it was as easy as the transpose. Matrix inversion is equal to the transpose in special, uh, special vector spaces which have very special spanning properties. Oh, like <laughs> four dimensions, a a arbitrary dimensions, right? yeah, 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 infinite dimensions, Hilbert spaces. <laughs> Let's worry about that when you get there. Okay, so that's that's it for today. Uh, don't panic. All that math is not testable. I just want to give you guys an appreciation that you can't just like cobble together a less than operator and expect all the math to work out. You, you have to do this with some care. So again. Friday, uh, maybe it'd be uh, beneficial for you to print out the exams for, so you have them on hand. I can't do it. I'll, I'll blow my print budget, which is zero. So. <laughs>